And now we're going to begin today's recorded portion of the event. So hello, muggles, non-magic and wizards alike. We're so happy to have you here at Hogwarts today. My name is Larissa Hatch, or Professor Hatch to all of you. And I'm a proud Slytherin holding the role of interim head of Slytherin House. I'm also the program officer of the IHL Youth Action Campaign Program here at the American Red Cross. And again, we're delighted to have you all join us here at Hogwarts for this special event. Before we get started, we just have a few housekeeping items to tend to. We will use GIFs and movements, so to our photosensitive viewers, just be mindful of some of these slides. We, of course, will be recording this magical presentation for those who weren't able to attend. Maybe some were busy watching a Quidditch match or are in detention. And of course, for all of our student advocates, you are more than welcome to use this or anything that we have today for your own youth action campaigns for this upcoming year. We'll also have a discussion guide with this presentation, along with all of our recordings, which can be found on our Rules of War Youth Action Campaign blog page, which one of my fellow professors just dropped in the chat for you. We, of course, welcome active conversation, but please ask to be respectful in the chat. We know there's a lot of love and strong opinions for these characters and their storylines, so please keep the conversation kind and respectful at all times, because failure to comply will result in expulsion from Hogwarts. Feel free, of course, to use the reactions to stay engaged and cheer on our in-house experts. And as we go along, please use the Q&A section so you can put your questions in as we continue the presentation. And we'll do our very best to get to them at the end. But if we're unable to reach everyone's questions, you're of course welcome to send us any OWL post at ihlyouth at redcross.org. The principles of international humanitarian law are exactly the sort of lessons that Dumbledore sought to instill in his students at Hogwarts. We know all too well that our favorite twins tested the limits, but always proceeded with cautions in their pranks. And to share his thoughts on the importance of IHL, we have a very special guest joining us. Oliver? Hey everybody there attending the American Red Cross International Humanitarian Law Harry Potter event. Oliver Phelps here guys, I've played George Weasley in the Harry Potter movies and I'm here to welcome you and to thank you so much for coming along today. Now you will obviously no doubt be aware that today's Harry Potter thing. So just a little heads up that you know if you haven't read all the books or seen all the movies um, there may be the odd spoiler here or there but that doesn't mean that you can't channel into it because today what is today all about it's learning all about the rules of war that protects human dignity and let's face it limits civilian casualties and all the bad things that come with that because it is such an important thing to stress because unfortunately war happens as bad as terrible and as truly shocking as these things are unfortunately these things happen but this is why the international humanitarian law is there so you're here to learn about all that today so look, i just want to welcome you today and uh, if there's any gryffindors out there hi to all the gryffindors do really really well today uh obviously representing the gryffindor houses but you know all the rest of them you know the slytherins mm, the ravenclaws the hufflepuffs and hey maybe if you're just a normal muggle anyway have an absolutely brilliant brilliant time today and just remember you're doing an amazing thing learning all these new things so look look after yourselves look after each other please be respectful of everyone else who's here today as well and just have an amazing amazing time all the best guys thank you oliver we're so grateful for you and your brother for your support in these crucial uh, global issues the Wizarding World truly provides a unique lens to explore IHL and serves as a great resource for learning about the important roles that protect in times of armed conflict. But I think it's time to get class started. So our first presenter is Hunter Burke, one of our IHL legal interns this year at the American Red Cross at National Headquarters. He represents the brave and resourceful Gryffindors. And without any further delay, I'll hand things over to Prefect Hunter. Thanks, Hunter. Thanks, Professor Hatch. As she said, I am Hunter Burke, a legal intern for the International Humanitarian Law Team here at American Red Cross National Headquarters. I am a prefect from Gryffindor House, home of all our favorites, Harry, Hermione, and all of the Weasleys. Like my house, I am courageous in pursuing law school, but more specifically supporting and raising awareness about IHL. Before we get into the Harry Potter universe, we need to cover some basics of international humanitarian law or IHL for short. There are four main sources of IHL, the four Geneva Conventions, there are two additional protocols, supplemental treaties, and international customary law. 
First, the four Geneva Conventions were universally ratified in 1949 in the fallout of World War II. Their purpose to provide minimum protections, standards of humane treatment, and fundamental guarantees of respect to individuals who become victims of armed conflicts. The additional protocols of 1977 were not signed onto by every country, but are still among the most widely recognized legal instruments. These protocols provide further protection for protected persons like civilians and prisoners of war and certain civilian objects. Treaties between two or more countries can provide limitations on the use of certain weapons or practices of war. Lastly, international customary law prohibits certain acts because they have been widely condemned for long periods of time. The International Committee of the Red Cross determined 161 customary IHL rules. These rules are important complements to the Geneva Conventions and the additional protocols that followed. They serve as a gap filler and provide protections during all armed conflicts. There are four principles of IHL, military necessity, distinction, proportionality, and the prohibition of unnecessary suffering. Military necessity requires that an attack must be intended to help in the military defeat of an enemy, and it must attack a military objective. Distinction forces those in armed conflict to distinguish between combatants and civilians. This principle restricts attacks aimed at civilians or civilian infrastructure. Proportionality requires that harm caused to civilians or civilian property be proportional to the military advantage anticipated from an attack. And finally, the prohibition of unnecessary suffering limits the use of certain methods or means of warfare, which uselessly aggravate the suffering of people. You will hear mentions of both the sources of IHL and the four principles throughout the rest of our discussions. Lastly, before we jump back into the Harry Potter universe, make note that we'll be treating the conflict between Harry Potter and Voldemort as an international armed conflict or IAC. This is important uh, for what IHL rules apply during the conflict. It would be completely reasonable to find the conflict as a non-international armed conflict, much like a civil war. However, for our purposes, we will discuss the laws that would apply if the first and second wizarding wars were deemed an international armed conflict. Anyone caught arguing this in the chat will be docked points in the House Cup. I hope that brief introduction into IHL has you excited to learn about IHL and the Harry Potter universe. With those things in mind, it is time we turn to the despoilment of human corpses, or rather the prohibition on ill treatment of the dead. In the Harry Potter universe, the dark arts included many threats. One of these includes the Inferi. Dumbledore detailed the Inferi as, quote, corpses, dead bodies that have been bewitched to do a dark wizard's bidding. Inferi have not been seen for a long time. However, not since Voldemort was last powerful. He killed enough people to make them an army, of course. In fact, during the First Wizarding War, Voldemort created an army of these Inferi from the large number of people he murdered. His Inferi army included mostly homeless muggles that mostly went unnoticed. However, some of them were the remains of wizards or witches who disappeared without a trace. It is unknown how many or who all fell victim to this fate, but it is probable that wizards from the ministry, the Order of the Phoenix, or other unlucky wizards or witches that crossed paths with Voldemort were among them. Voldemort used these forces in combat, but afterwards, their primary objective was to protect Cave Lake, where Voldemort had hidden Salazar Slytherin's locket. This locket was one of his horcruxes and could be seen floating across the screen there. This led Harry and Dumbledore to the Hidden Lake. Once there, the pair went to an island in the middle where they found a false locket, but they soon became very thirsty due to a spell that immediately dehydrated the Witcher Wizard. The only water source was the lake, but danger lurked underneath. In fact, Harry was nearly dragged underwater to his death. Of course, this near-death experience was all in vain as Regulus Black's house elf creature had stolen the locket, and while he intended to destroy it, 
he fails. IHL clearly prohibits this. IHL requires respect for the dead and protects the killed against mistreatment. The fourth Geneva Convention, both additional protocols, various treaties and customary IHL rules prohibit the mistreatment of corpses. This prohibition extends in both international armed conflicts and non-international armed conflicts. Beyond pure violation, mutilation, and mistreatment of the dead, there are other requirements for treatment of the dead that you will hear more about later. I hope this was illuminating. I will now pass it to the representative from Slytherin who will discuss a similar topic, the treatment of enemy civilians during armed conflicts. I hope you can trust what she says, but I guess not all Slytherins are bad. Over to you, Hershita. Hey everyone, my name is Hershita Ganesan and I am an IHL YAC advocate from the Southeast and Caribbean division, specifically the Georgia region. So there are many, many great people from the House of Slytherin. Voldemort, however, was not one of them. He was needless to say, cruel and evil. During his initial rise to power, he tortured, terrorized, and killed people across both the wizarding and muggle world. He stopped at no lengths, using blackmail and flattery to bring wizards and creatures to his side. Nonetheless, when he tried to persuade the goblin race to join him, they were surprisingly stubborn in their refusal. They favored the wizards, but did not spokenly take sides or engage in hostilities. This enraged Voldemort, and he proceeded to kill four goblin families residing in Nottingham. Since the goblins didn't partake in hostilities, they were classified as non-combatants. This made them protected persons that could not be targeted under IHL. The motive behind this execution could be revenge, a threat, or even Voldemort's twisted form of pleasure. Regardless, the action was definitely a violation of IHL. So the Hague Conventions and the Geneva Conventions, two fundamental sources of IHL, both include laws to protect people affected by armed conflict, specifically civilians not involved in the conflict. To further explain, before any civilian is killed, there is a strict procedure to be followed. Unless the act is of utmost military necessity, the killing of a non-combatant or protected person is restricted by IHL. While this may come as a surprise, the killing of civilians is actually allowed under cer certain circumstances of IHL and war. IHL states that civilians can never be indiscriminately targeted. In other words, civilians cannot be randomly or purposefully targeted. To do so would be a grave breach of IHL and likely a war crime. In addition, civilians cannot be disproportionately harmed. For example, a weapon that cannot be controlled and would harm more civilians than necessary to achieve a military goal or advantage is not permitted. Having said all that, IHL recognizes that civilian debts are inevitable in war, and 100% of these debts cannot be prevented. In the situation of Voldemort murdering the Goblin families, it violates IHL in two different ways. The first being that there was no military goal from Voldemort and therefore the killing of goblins served no purpose and provided no advantage. The second being Voldemort murdered specific civilian targets. The goblins were protected persons and could not be the intended target of an attack. About 30 years later, during the period of Voldemort's return, we can see a violation of all the laws above through the murder of Cedric Diggory. Cedric was an innocent civilian that had absolutely no clue about Voldemort's return. Considering this, Cedric could not have participated in hostile actions. If we recall in the fourth Harry Potter book, at the end of the Triwizard Tournament, Cedric and Harry agreed to share the Triwizard Cup and reach for it together. The cup was switched out for a portkey before the final task began, and therefore Cedric and Harry were transported to a grave where Voldemort ordered his servant to kill the spare. Cedric is then killed by the killing curse, Avada Kedavra. The scenario is a violation for, of IHL for all the same reasons as Voldemort murdering the goblin families 30 years ago. If we travel back to the first wizarding war, 
James and Lily Potter, the parents of Harry Potter, were murdered by Voldemort. While James and Lily Potter were portrayed in the movies as normal civilians, generally as a happy couple with a baby child, they were legally combatants. As members of the Order of the Phoenix, they would not be protected persons, such as the Goblin families or Cedric Diggory. While perhaps unfair, their killing was likely legal under IHL. However, the attempted murder of Harry would not have been, since he was a protected person as a minor. There were, def there were definitely moments in Harry Potter where humanity with an IHL was exemplary and a show of how countries should act. However, there were also several bre breaches of the law as discussed above. These laws were broken by both sides in the Harry Potter world, albeit more so by the Death Eaters and Voldemort. I will now pass it on to Miranda Surrett, a representative from the Hufflepuff House. Thank you, Harshita. Hello, everyone. My name is Miranda Surrett. I am an IHL Youth Action Campaign Advocate from the Asia Pacific Division, specifically the Korea region. I am representing the House of Hufflepuff today. Shout out to all the Hufflepuffs out there. As a member of Hufflepuff, I display the traits of hard work, dedication, loyalty, and fair play, which is fitting for someone so passionate about IHL and non-discriminatory medical care. Today, I'm going to be talking about two very IHL, two very important IHL topics, which are non-discriminatory medical care and repatriation of the dead. I hope you all learned something today. IHL tries to protect health in armed conflicts by requiring parties to an armed conflict to ensure that adequate medical care is provided without discrimination and with the least possible delay. The first and second Geneva Conventions stipulate that wounded, sick, and shipwrecked members of armed forces and other protected persons must be treated humanely and cared for by the party to the conflict in whose power they may be without any distinction based on sex, race, nationality, or political affiliation. No attempts can be made upon their life. In particular, they cannot be murdered or exterminated, subject to torture or to biological experiments or willfully left without any medical assistance and care. The conventions also specify that only urgent medical reasons will determine priority in order of treatment to be administered and emphasize that women must be treated with all consideration due to their sex. That is to say that if a number of the armed forces finds themselves injured or sick in enemy territory, the enemy forces must provide humane medical care. Medical personnel may not be punished for providing impartial care. On the subject of providing impartial medical care, the picture on the left, in the picture on the left, we can see World War I medical staff providing care to German soldiers on the battlefield. Parties to an armed conflict may not impede the provision of care by preventing the passage of medical personnel. They must facilitate access to the wounded and sick and provide all necessary assistance and protection to medical personnel. Safe access to health care is essential for both civilians and combatants during times of conflict. But for this to happen, healthcare personnel must be respected and protected by all parties and be able to perform their humanitarian duty without fearing for safety. The wounded and sick must be treated without discrimination. If distinctions are to be made, it can only be on the basis of medical condition. During times of conflict, medical professionals must be able to triage cases and treat the most severe cases first. Patients with very severe wounds whose management would consume too many resources and too much time and who have little chance of survival may have to wait or receive minimal care in the interest of being able to effectively provide care. Doctors and nurses must often choose to treat first the patients for whom the smallest surgery would give the best results. Some armies have practiced inverted or reverse triage, which is when the least injured were treated first so as to make them able to return more quickly to battle. It should be noted that this practice is a violation of IHL. The ICRC has developed a system of four categories that relate to the triaging of patients during times of conflict. The first category is serious wounds. These are patients who need life-saving surgery and have a good chance of recovery. Category two is second priority wounds. 
These are patients who require surgery, but not on an urgent basis, such as a fracture, a bone fracture, or a bone break. Category three patients do not require hospitalization and or surgery because their wounds are minor enough to be managed in the emergency room. These are often called the walking wounded. Category four is the most severe, the most severe of all the categories. These are patients with injuries so severe that they are unlikely to survive or would have very poor quality of survival. If we look at the man on the right side of the slide, he seems to have suffered every wound and injury known to mankind. During a time of conflict, he would most likely be classified as a category four patient because he has so many injuries and wounds that it would require the ICRC to utilize too many resources and surgeries to treat a patient who may not survive. The Battle of Hogwarts was the final conflict of the Seconding, Second Wizarding War. When Lord Voldemort realized that Harry Potter had secretly ventured into the castle to locate and destroy one of his final Horcruxes, he ordered every single Death Eater and dark creature that had ever pledged loyalty to him to launch a massive attack on the school. The Battle of Hogwarts led to several wizard and witch fatalities. During the Battle of Hogwarts, the fatalities shown in movie scenes are individuals who fought alongside Harry Potter. The fatalities mentioned are Fred Weasley, Remus Lupin, Nymphadora Tonks, Colin Creevy, Lavender Brown, and of course, Severus Snape. Along with the named fatalities, there were those known as the Fallen 50. The Fallen 50 were the unknown people who were killed fighting Lord Voldemort and his Death Eaters during the Battle of Hogwarts. Their ranks included students, students, staff and teachers, parents, and others who had rallied to defend Hogwarts when Voldemort moved against it. Voldemort said, you have one hour, dispose of your dead with dignity, treat your injured. In this quote, the mention of the word your means that Voldemort believes that the dead should be treated separately based on whether or not they were his supporters. The fatalities and medical care shown in the Great Hall after the battle are all people who had opposed Voldemort during the conflict. No one from Voldemort's side is shown receiving care. This would be a violation of IHL on providing non-discriminatory medical care because the only ones receiving the care are people who would be considered to be on what is known as the good side. Voldemort's followers and supporters are not shown receiving care so we can assume that they are being discriminated against because of their loyalties and are not being afforded the same level of medical care and triage. Parties to the conflict must endeavor to facilitate the return of the remains of the deceased upon request of the party to which they belong or upon the request of next of kin. In a resolution adopted in 1974 by the UN General Assembly, it calls upon parties to armed conflicts, regardless of their character and location, during and after hostilities, and in accordance with the Geneva Conventions, to take any action to facilitate the return of remains as requested by families. To fulfill its task of disseminating IHL, the ICRC has delegates around the world teaching armed and security forces that the return of remains and ashes of the deceased to the home state shall be facilitated without with no matter the cost. The ICRC often acts as a neutral intermediary between the parties to the conflict regarding servicemen that are missing in action so that the mortal remains of combatants may be returned to respective parties. In Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, we are introduced to Frank Bryce. Bryce is a muggle who worked for the Riddle family as their caretaker and gardener. Bryce was murdered by Voldemort after Nagini told Voldemort and Peter Pettigrew that Bryce was overhearing them discussing the plans to murder Harry. Bryce's body was then left by Lord Voldemort. In Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1, we are introduced to ba Bathilda Bagshot. Bagshot was a British witch and the author of A History of Magic, which has been utilized in the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry class titled A History of Magic. Bethilda's corpse was utilized by Lord Voldemort as a way to contain the soul of his pet snake, Nagini. Nagini leapt from Bethilda's body in an effort to attack Harry Potter, leaving the woman for good. 
after Voldemort was done using her body, he left the old woman's body and never returned it to the family. Like Bryce and Bagshot, the people that are killed by Lord Voldemort using the killing curse are never repatriated back to their families for a proper burial. This would be a violation of international humanitarian law because both sides of a conflict are supposed to make every effort to repatriate bodies for proper procedures. I hope that learning about non-discriminatory medical care and repatriation of the dead was interesting. I will now pass it over to Professor Hatch, who will administer this year's OWL examinations. Thank you, Ms. Surratt, and I will be sure to talk to Professor Spout about making you a prefect next year. So, so far in our IHL studies, we've learned about the treatment of the dead and treatment of civilians, as well as medical care during armed conflicts. So it's now time to take your OWL examinations. Same as with the sorting hat, you're going to see a um, link onto our mentee with our magical numbers to be able to participate. So again, menti.com and the magical digits, which one of my fellow professors will put in the chat, this time is 40705991. All right, we will get started. Again, no cheating. True or false, the valid military objective of protecting the locket Horcrux made Voldemort's use of the inquiry legal under IHL. True or false. Again, keep track of your own answers, although we are taking note back behind the scenes as well for grading purposes. A few more people, a few more of our wizards join the, quit the exam. There we go. Lots of wizards thinking false. That is correct. Good job. Next question. The killing of which of the following people was legal by you know who? A, James Potter and Lily Potter, B, Cedric Diggory, or C, Bethilda Bagshaw? James and Lily getting a lot of attention. We'll give it a few more seconds, see what last wizard's answers trickle in. All right, those that selected James and Lily Potter are correct. We're legal because they were combatants. Very, very impressed, you are correct. All right, true or false, targeting random civilians is legal within IHL. Shot right up false, lots of people putting false right away. Give it a couple more seconds. We cannot trick these wizards. I think we're gonna see a lot of outstandings and excellence. This is very good. You're all correct, that said false. Let's see if we can uh, get a trick question towards you. Why is the mention of the word your in Voldemort's quote so significant to medical care and IHL? Remember the quote was, you have one hour to dispose of your dead with dignity, treat your injured. A, it shows that he believes everyone should have equal access to medical care. B, it shows that he believes that his supporters should receive the best care possible and no one else should care. And C, it shows that he supports equal and humane medical care for everyone. What's very interesting here is you wouldn't think that Voldemort would care, but he actually is abiding by IHL by saying that, as you heard Ms. Surratt say. So you are correct, those who said C. Great job. Again, we're going to be taking in, uh, into consideration your exams for um, our House Cup following who we have now as Ms. Stefan to focus on our special YAC theme of the environment. And this is where um, we see the environment show up in Harry Potter and Fantastic Beast series, which is going to help us for next year's uh, YAC theme. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Amelia. Thank you, Professor Hatch. <clears throat> My name is Amelia Steffen, and I am a legal intern with the IHL team, and I am a proud Ravenclaw. And today I'm here to talk about environmental modification and environmental violations of IHL. And I think the importance of examining this topic is best explained by Ravenclaw's motto, Whip Beyond Measure is a man's greatest treasure. So 
What are environmental modifications? Environmental modifications and environmental damage during conflict can be seen throughout the wizarding world in various forms. And environmental modification can cause devastating effects on the environment. For example, environmental modification can damage ecosystems and wildlife as well as displace civilians. And so what are the ways that environmental modification is used in the wizarding world? And first, I wanted to start by examining weather modifying charms. Weather modifying charms directly control and change the weather. And currently, there are about six weather modifying charms that are known to be used by witches and wizards. And I would like to note that actually the Committee on Experimental Charms under the Ministry of Ma Magic has been doing a study on the use of these weather, weather modifying charms and is trying to decide whether this group of charms should actually be regulated due to their impact on the environment. So in the GIF on the left, you can see Newt's commander using the Ventus charm against an ore sent by the Ministry of Magic. And there are most likely several issues with Newt's commander using this charm in public. Uh, first and foremost, I'm certain the Ministry would be displeased that muggles are witnessing magic. However, this charm is directly changing the weather. In this instance, Newt is probably not causing any severe damage to the environment, but imagine if a wizard such as he who must not be named were to use the Ventus spell. The spell would be able to take out towns and cities and cause environmental disaster. Now, in the GIF on the top right, you can see Barty Crouch Jr. pretending to be Alistair Moody, and he's putting out a storm in the Great Hall by using the atmospheric charm. And the atmospheric charm creates rainfall, and notably this charm was used in the Ministry of Magic when the Death Eaters took over the ministry, and then they were unable to stop the rain in certain offices. And again, in this GIF, um, the charm is not actually causing any damage to the environment, but you can imagine if this charm were used on a larger scale, how it could result in environmental damage. And then the GIF on the bottom right, you can see a young Dumbledore casting the nebulous spell on an uncharacteristically clear London day. And the nebulous spell creates a fog, changing the weather in London for witches, wizards, and muggles alike. And there are several other weather modifying charms that have the potential to result in environmental damage if used on a large scale. The Tempest Jinx charm was most notably used by Grindelwald when escaping from prison. And the Tempest Jinx charm creates lightning strikes and the witcher wizard performing the charm can strike their opponent with lightning. And next there is the Snowfall spell, which creates snowfall. And last but not least, we have Stella Cascadia and that creates a meteor shower. And it's not hard to imagine the destruction that could be caused by these spells if they were used during conflict. The snowfall spell could create winter and summer, causing harm to ecosystems and wildlife, and not to mention causing issues for civilians and muggles alike. And Stella Cascadia could have drastic effects on the environment if a meteor shower were to be summoned down to the earth. And weather modifying charms are not the only spells that can cause environmental modification and damage during battle. There are several other spells and creatures used in the wizarding world that have been shown to modify the environment and create environmental damage. So this next set of spells are not considered weather changing charms, but can still modify the environment and create environmental damage. And these spells are fire spells. So the picture on the slide depicts the use of the spell fiend fire, um, used by Vincent Crabbe during the Battle of Hogwarts. And Fiend Fire is an advanced dark magic spell that was found to be capable of destroying Horcruxes. And I actually think it's really interesting to note that Hermione knew that Fiend Fire was capable of destroying the Horcruxes, but she thought it was far too dangerous to attempt to cast um, on her own. However, Crabbe did not exactly believe that. So fiend fire produces extremely large and hot flames that are capable of destroying everything in their path. And fiend fire is immensely powerful and very hard for the caster to control. The flames produced by fiend fire cannot be extinguished by regular or enchanted water. And the caster of the fiend fire spell can only extinguish the flames by knowing the charm that ceases the flames. So during the Battle of Hogwarts, um, Crab cast Fiendfire in the Room of Requirement in an attempt to actually kill Hermione, Ron, and Harry. Luckily, the trio managed to escape the Room of Requirement. However, Crab was unable to control the flames, and it is believed that he died in the fire. Fiendfire destroyed the Room of Requirement and destroyed one of Voldemort's Horcruxes. And the Horcrux that Fiendfire destroyed just happened to be Rowena Ravenclaw's diadem. 
With all that said, Fiendfire is clearly a very dangerous and powerful spell. When used in battle, Fiendfire has the ability to incinerate everything in its path and is capable of creating large wildfires and destroying the environment. And while Fiendfire may be the most powerful fire spell, it is not the only fire spell that can result in environmental modification or damage. Another notable fire spell is Firestorm, um, which creates a ring of flame similar to a lasso and that the caster can control and direct. And then the final notable fire spell I'm going to mention is the Gubrathian fire spell, which creates an everlasting flame. And this spell in particular could actually have many non-harmful uses outside of battle, but if used by a witch or wizard with ill intent, it could definitely create environmental damage. Imagine setting a fire to a for setting fire to a forest or an area, and then it's an everlasting flame, and that fire can't be put out. And finally, I wanted to talk about dementors and how they negatively affect the surrounding environment. So dementors are known to bring about a coldness when they enter the area. For example, the picture on the slide depicts Harry fighting off dementors at the Great Lake using the Patronus charm. However, you can see that the lake is frozen over. And the lake froze over as a byproduct of the Dementor's presence. And generally, a thin layer of ice forms when Dementors are in the area and nearby plants wither and freeze. And you can think of how a sudden freezing of the environment would really negatively affect the animals and plants in the area, and how long it may take the ecosystem to recover from a sudden freeze. And the effects Dementors have on the environment are unnatural and have the potential to be extremely damaging. Dementors have the ability to modify the environment to be cold and icy, even in the middle of the summer. I think this is best illustrated in Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, when Harry and Dudley were attacked by Dementors on Privet Drive during one of the hottest days of the summer. And on that day, um, the air still turned cold, ice formed, and plants died. And there are many, many reasons why Dementors should not be used during conflict um, or outside of conflict due to their effects on humans. However, it is also interesting to consider the negative effects that Dementors have on the environment. So now that we've seen some examples of how environmental modification is used in the wizarding world and how it can cause environmental damage, I wanted to explore the ways IHL works to protect the environment. And so first I wanted to talk about the Environmental Modification Convention or NMOD for short. So parties to NMOD agree not to engage in military or any other hostile use of environmental modification techniques that have widespread, long-lasting, or severe effects as a means of destruction, damage, or injury to another party. So to fully understand what NMOD prohibits, I wanted to touch upon the definition of widespread, long-lasting, and severe. So widespread generally means damage that extends several hundred kilometers, including damage extending to areas that were not directly affected by the method of warfare. Long lasting generally means direct and indirect effects lasting a decade or longer. And severe generally means disruption or damage to the ecosystem as well as harm to the health or survival of the population. So now what exactly is an environmental modification technique under NMOD? An environmental modification technique is any technique for changing through the deliberate manipulation of natural processes, the dynamics, composition, or structure of the earth. And this means changing the atmosphere or even outer space. So with this understanding of NMOD in mind, it is arguable that all weather modifying charms violate NMOD when used in conflict. Weather modifying charms change the atmosphere and have widespread effects. Also, weather modifying charms have long-term effects on the environment. For example, um, causing massive amounts of rain um, caused by the atmospheric charm could result in flooding, and that flooding would cause a disruption to the eco ecosystem. Or a sudden snowfall in the summer could kill plants and animals that aren't prepared for a sudden snowfall. And these effects would certainly cause disruption to the ecosystem, and it is plausible that this disruption would affect the health and survival of the civilian population. So under this analysis, it also seems that NMOD would prohibit the use of fire spells and dementors during war, and both of these modify the environment and have similar, similar effects to the weather modifying charms when it comes to widespread, long-lasting, and severe. So next, I wanted to talk about how these charms and creatures would violate additional protocol one, which I will refer to as AP1. So articles 35 and 55 of AP1 directly protect the environment from widespread, long-term, and severe damage. 
And the definitions of widespread, long-term, and severe are the same as the definitions we talked about on the previous slide um, for NMOD. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, weather modifying charms, fire spells, and dementors all have the tendency to cause widespread, long-term, and severe environmental damage. So the analysis under AP1 is very similar to the analysis under NMOD. This is to say that the use of these charms in creatures during conflict most likely violates AP1 because of the widespread long-term and severe damage they are capable of causing. And so finally, I wanted to touch upon how the four IHL principles generally prohibit the use of weather modifying charms, fire spells, and dementors during conflict. First and foremost, all of these methods of warfare violate the principle of distinction. Weather modifying charms change the weather and do not distinguish between parties to the conflict and civilians. So an atmospheric charm will create rainfall for everyone in the area, regardless if they are civilian or not. And further, the effects of the atmos atmospheric charm will be felt by everyone in the area. And actually, fiend fire is a really great example of violating the principle of distinction since it is so hard for the caster to control. Even if the caster intends for the fire to only attack another party to the conflict, the fire will most likely start attacking others in the vicinity, even if they are civilians. And dementors similarly violate the principle of distinction since they attack everyone who is in the area. Um, and this can also be seen in that example of Harry and Dudley during that summer day on Privet Drive when the dementors started attacking Dudley as well as Harry. So beyond the principle of distinction, these methods of warfare also pre present issues for the principles of military necessity, uh, proportionality, and limiting unnecessary suffering. So military necessity prohibits the needless destruction of the environment. Proportionality helps reduce collateral damage, and limiting unnecessary suffering prohibits the destruction of the environment that will result in unnecessary suffering by the civilian population. Weather modifying charms, fire spells, and dementors have the potential to needlessly damage the environment, resulting in collateral damage that results in the suffering by the civilian population. For example, the use of the atmos atmospheric charm could cause flooding, that flooding damages crops, creates a food shortage, and affects the civilian population and results in unnecessary suffering. So as I mentioned before, um, the Committee on Experimental Charms has been looking at regulating the use of weather modifying charms because of their effect on the environment. But I think perhaps that the Ministry of Magic should also consider um, looking at the use of fire spells and dementors during conflict and outside of conflict and consider regulating their use as well. So with that, I'm now going to pass it back over to Professor Hatch. Thank you, Amelia. And that is truly tragic about CRAB, but may that be a lesson to all of you students that NMOD poses a great danger and it's a valuable topic to explore perhaps in your youth action campaigns this year, if you so choose. But it is now time to announce this house, this year's House Cup winners. Um, owls have been graded, detentions have been subtracted, and all necessary calculations, as you've been seeing in the chat, are complete. The sorting hat here and I have the official uh, results. So, again, it is with great difficulty that I announce Gryffindor wins the House Cup, as always it seems. But interesting point totals we have here. An extra 10 points as a head to the start into the next year for anyone that recognizes the importance of each of these numbers. Given Gry Gryffindor's success this year, we will have Prefect Hunter share another topic focusing on the second Wizarding War. Thanks, Hunter. Oh my, Birdie bots every flavor beans. I can't believe we won the House Cup again. Thank you, Professor Hatch. Good job to all my fellow Gryffindors. Congrats to that close place, Slytherin. Don't worry, Hufflepuff, you'll get them next year. And as a reward for the hard work for all of us Gryffindors, I'll get to present on our last topic here today. Uh, so I will be discussing the Muggle-Born Registration Commission through the lens of occupation and discrimination. Recall that Voldemort used the Imperious Curse to control the Minister of Magic. Within one month of Voldemort seizing power over the ministry, the Department of Mysteries released a study that magic could only be inherited. Thus, Muggleborns, or wizards and witches without one parent who was a wizard or witch, could only have gotten their power by stealing or using force against a wizard or witch. For example, by stealing their wands. The Muggleborn Registration Commission was then established to investigate these crimes. 
The Voldemort ministry used this as a tool to discriminate it against those that did not fall in line with Death Eater ideology. Muggle-born wizards and witches were forced to appear at the ministry to be interviewed. Those who refused were faced with snatchers, and some of these encounters turned fatal, such as Dirk Cresswell and Ted Tonks. After registering and being interviewed, some Muggle-borns were arrested and sent to Azkaban. At the very least, they were stripped of their wands and their jobs. Even pure-blooded wizards that were pro-Muggle, like Arthur Weasley, were blackballed in their jobs. While half-bloods were ridiculed because of the dilution, they were allowed to re remain citizens. The commission also distributed propaganda against Muggle-borns. These interviews turned out to be interrogations and trials. Prior to the trials, suspects were detained and watched over by Dementors, which seems like a form of intimidation because of the Dementors kiss, which is worse than fatal. These trials were headed by Dolores Umbridge. While trying to retrieve a Horcrux, the trio interrupted the trial of Mary Cattermole. So if you see this picture here on the left, it's our favorite person in the entire world. Dolores Umbridge can be described by many things, but kind, gentle, or anything short of murderous don't quite fit the bill. In her time at Hogwarts, she used her power to severely punish those who disobeyed her. This did not change when she moved her power over to the ministry. She was an active judge in the interviews conducted by the Muggle-born Registration Commission. Mary Cattermole's trial, who can be seen in the two pictures on the right, was, a, was from a non-wizarding family, but became a witch and married a Ministry of Magic employee. As a Muggle-born, she was accused of stealing a wand of a pureblood or half-blood witch or wizard to become a witch. She was brought before a trial by the Muggle-born Registration Commission. At her interview or trial, she was interrogated by Umbridge and Yaxley. Notably, in the picture on the top right, you can see a Patronus charm uh, in the shape of a uh, a cat. This uh, points to signs of coercion. Her cat Patronus disappoint all cat lovers out there. Mary would have surely been convicted and sent to Azkaban if not for the help of Harry and Hermione, who were disguised using Polyjuice Potion. Harry, Hermione, and Ron, who was disguised as uh, Mary Cattermole's husband, Reginald, assisted her and a group of Muggleborns who had been in for questioning to escape the ministry. In the Deathly Hallows book, Harry advised Mary and the actual Reginald to take their children and flee the country while Voldemort was still in power. These actions by Voldemort and his Death Eaters raised several issues of IHL. First, under occupation law, the occupying power does not acquire sovereignty over the occupied territory and is required to respect the existing laws and institutions of the occupied territory as far as possible. It is presumed that occupation will be temporary and that the occupying power shall preserve the status quo in the occupied area. Here, nearly immediately after taking power over the ministry, Voldemort placed loyal followers in places of power and used their positions to change laws and criminalize people based on their birth status and blood purity. The Death Eaters would say that this would be justified in their actions because Muggleborns, or as they would call them, mudbloods, posed a security threat to the occupation. However, due to the extreme nature of their actions, the Death Eaters did not preserve the status quo and drastically changed the laws of the country. Second, discrimination is prohibited under IHL. All protected persons, including POWs and civilians, should be treated with the same consideration and distinction based on criteria such as race, nationality, or religion is strictly prohibited. Blood purity is the relevant criteria here and surely would be covered under this rule. The use of government resources and media to convince the wizarding population of the supposed necessity only furthers the evidence that the discrimination was part of a larger takeover. Here, you can see Harry summoning due process for trials in the wizarding world. The conventions and international law protect people accused of criminal offenses. The accused shall be provided with proceedings respecting internationally recognized judicial guarantees. For example, they must be informed of the reason for their arrest, charged with a specific offense, and given a fair trial as quickly as possible. The Voldemort ministry falls short of these guarantees in several ways. 
Most of the accused were misled on why they were to appear. Their charge differed immensely from the laws prior to the invasion. And lastly, their trials were not fair. They were not allowed to seek counsel or prepare a defense. They were forced to provide their evidence of innocence while Umbridge had to provide no evidence of guilt. And lastly, the use of dementors in these trials shows the threat of violence and coercion prohibited under international law. The list goes on for why these trials were a sham and violated IHL. So like Harry says here, accio due process. These offenses could even rise to genocide or attempted genocide, given the intent to cleanse the wizarding world of muggle-born wizards and witches as the basis for the commission and offenses. I wanna personally thank everyone so much for attending and staying engaged throughout. If you're watching this in the future, thanks for using your time turner to join us. Professor Hatch will now facilitate us through some questions. Thank you, Hunter, and thank you to all of our House representative presenters today. A warm round of applause for all of you, even the people that are a little upset in the chat. I do, to my own chagrin, um, agree that Gryffindor won fair and square today and for this year. Uh, we have some great questions in the chat and from some of our audience members. So we'll start with one for our Slytherin House. Harshita, how is it ever okay to kill civilians? Why does IHL allow this? So civilians can be um, killed when, and it's legal to kill civilians when it falls within the four principles of IHL. Proportionality and distinction um, are the two main ones. So if you have a military goal and to achieve that goal, um, not enough, sorry, I'm not sure, entirely sure how to phrase this, but if you achieve that goal and a very limited number of civilians are killed and that goal is more important than the number of civilians killed, then that is permissible. Absolutely. And for those who are some of our IHL instructors and YAC advocates, um, what Harshita is referring to is uh, the principle of proportionality. Um, so great answer there. And we can really dig into that more this upcoming year as well in the program. Um, for Hufflepuff, why is repatriation of the dead, such as Bethilda Bagshot and Frank Bryce, such an important part of IHL? Why should we care about people after they are dead? So repatriation of the dead is important is so important because it is because in it, in situations of conflict, regardless of whether somebody is a combatant or a non-combatant, um, it's still important for them to be returned to their families and their countries so that they can receive the proper honor and the proper um, burial that they the burial that they are deserved. And like the Geneva Convention say, um, it's it's all parties have to make every effort to repatriate the dead. Um, it's, it's mostly the reason why we should care. It's a reason of, um, it's a reason of just honor and respect to the dead. So we should care about them regardless of, you know, even if they're dead, they deserve to be buried and they deserve to have a proper funeral procedure based on the person, you know, based on if they were a combatant or a non-combatant. Absolutely. And we see that again, Sometimes we think it's just very black and white. Voldemort's bad and Harry Potter and his friends are good. But Voldemort actually did the right thing in the Battle of Hogwarts, right? And so seeing that as an example, there are reasons why we should be um, protecting civilian life and, and honoring the, um, the principles of IHL for those exact reasons. Thank you. Thank you, Hufflepuff. Um, we're going to move over to Ravenclaw with Ms. Stephens. Um, how would the nebulous spell causing fog violate IHL. It doesn't seem that fog has the potential to cause the same severe effects as other weather modifying charms. For sure. So at first glance, the nebulous spell and just causing fog doesn't um, seem like it would be that serious, especially um, there are a lot of areas that do suffer from lots of fog. But if you are a witch or wizard that is continuously casting the nebulous spell and continuously making a place really foggy, um, 
you can control that and you could make the fog last for large periods of time fulfilling um, our bar for what it means to be long lasting. And also when fog is cast, thick fog, um, it can block um, sun, which is need of which the civilian population will need. It can also really hinder transportation and specifically the transportation of goods and services such as food. And so the civilian population there would not be able to get really important things that they would need just for their health and survival. And so those are just a couple of ways in which the nebula spell could actually have some really harmful effects um, on the environment um, and also on the civilian population. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you, Ravenclaw. Um, we're going to move over to Gryffindor. Hunter, it makes sense that an occupying force can't discriminate against the people living under them. But what about other legal changes, liberation of people or things like that? Yeah, so the occupying power has a lot of responsibilities that fall on them. So the uh, there's a lot of rules that are uh, drawn out in the Gene Geneva Conventions, and mainly these are about uh, public safety, whether that be um, proper hygiene or humanitarian aid or to the fullest extent. Um, like they have to provide food and medical care when possible. You have specific rules for when you can intern civilians, so only if they are a security threat to uh, the occupying force. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, things that are responsible for an occupying power, and that uh, the rule essentially here that we were trying to get across was that you can't do those things in a discriminatory manner. So you can't single out a particular class or race or religion uh, that you are going to treat separately as you would, um, under, under your own laws. So. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Gryffindor, we're going to bounce back over to Hufflepuff. Uh, great question here. When a military force kills their opponent opponents, they are sometimes buried in mass graves and are told not, are not told to the families is there, they are buried in mass graves and sometimes their families are not told. Is this a violation of humanitarian law? So yes, this would be a violation of IHL law because the third and the fourth, Gen actually all of the Geneva Conventions have some aspect of burying in individual graves, whether um, the third Geneva Convention especially says that, um, that, com that enemy combatants and anybody has to make sure that for the first priority is to bury in individual graves unless that's un unless mass graves are unavoidable. So yes, it would be a violation of, I of international humanitarian law because they're supposed to first bury in individual graves unless that's not possible. Thank you, Miranda. I have um, two more quick questions and then we're gonna move on here. But this one again is for Ravenclaw. I'm talking about NMOD. <clears throat> Are there any real world equivalents, do you think, to Dementors in terms of weathering effects? At this point in time, uh, and off the top of my head, I can't think of any specific real world um, the equivalence to Dementors that could cause that. However, I think with advances in technology and also just advances in warfare, um, we could definitely come up with something that could have similar effects to Dementors. And I think that that in mod would definitely be applicable in those situations. And also there may be um, there may be something out there that I have not that I've not heard of yet. But um, but I think that especially with technology and everything, we could see that. Yeah, good point. Things are ever evolving, right? Um, our final question, I will take this, um, learning a little bit about what the Youth Action Campaign this year is and the timeline. Um, so stick around after the presentation ends recording. We're going to show a little bit more details about that. But um, we are beginning it. It's, it follows the academic calendar school year. So um, we're, we have curriculum. And right now, we're hoping that advocates are creating their teams. And Red Cross regions are recruiting coordinators getting ready for this year. Red Cross clubs and other organizations are welcome and invited to participate. And we're gonna focus again this year on the environment and armed conflict, climate change and its effects, um, wildlife protection, displaced people patterns, all sorts of things. And uh, that will begin 
kind of at the beginning of the, the school year for that specific school. So we're in July and the beginning of August. Right now we're trying to ramp up and get ready. And then come uh, the end of August, September, that's when you'll begin to train your advocates on the program this year. More details to follow. And again, of course, you can always email us if you're interested um, to learn more. But uh, we really appreciate everyone's patience. There's a lot of great questions. Uh, if you can go to the, the next slide, Sorting Hat, we will um, show you where to send those questions to. Um, so we, uh, we hope you learned something. I find this to be truly enlightening from all of our house representatives. Um, hopefully you are inspired to seek IHL in some of your other favorite books and movies. We always enjoy exploring various worlds and popular series. And in fact, we'll be sponsoring a similar event on September 1st in honor of the launch of the new Lord of the Rings series. So stay tuned for that. We'll send more details as soon as we get that seminar ready to go. Thank you again to all of our in-house experts for your insight and knowledge. And thank you all to, to you as our Hogwarts attendees, our audience for coming and sharing your passion and curiosity with us today. I also want to thank the IHL team working hard as house elves behind the scenes. We couldn't have done it without any of you. And again, if you have any questions, we apologize. We couldn't get to all of them, but please send them via our post to ihlyouth at redcross.org. Thanks again for coming. We appreciate your time.